Every beautiful, amazing thing that's ever been created came from someone's imagination when they started asking questions. Hi, I'm Crystal Dwyer Hansen. Hi, I'm Mark Victor Hansen. This is Win the Day. And what James Whitaker is going to do is help you win your day, not to be a little success, but a colossally superstar success, which is deeply embedded in the heart and soul of you. You're listening to Win the Day with James Whitaker. What we do in life echoes in eternity. Broadcasting from Los Angeles, California, here's your host, James Whitaker. Let's go. Hey, winners. This is a big one. Welcome to episode 150 of the Win the Day podcast. The quote for this episode comes from Albert Einstein and says, The answer is in the question. Given that we're celebrating a milestone, I've brought in the big guns. Joining me in the studio are personal development icons Mark Victor Hansen and Crystal Dwyer Hansen. Mark is best known for creating the Chicken Soup for the Soul book series alongside his partner, Jack Canfield. Together, they've sold more than 500 million books in 54 languages. They also licensed more than 100 products under the Chicken Soup banner worth more than $1 billion. Mark has received countless awards for his humanitarian work and his contributions to the field of personal growth and entrepreneurship. And fun fact, he's in the Guinness Book of World Records for having the most books on the New York Times bestseller list at any one time. His wife, Crystal, is also an expert in human potential. Crystal's research in the field of neuroscience, epigenetics, and quantum physics provides a scientific knowledge she uses to help move people out of misery and into a fulfilled and happy life. She's also a member of the International Coaching Federation, a certified clinical hypnotherapist, and the founder of Crystal Vision. Life. In 2020, Mark and Crystal co authored the book sitting in front of us today called Ask. And if you know one thing about me, it's how much I believe that the right question can get you anything that you want in life. Together, they also work on numerous other projects in the fields of publishing, natural energy, and conservation, and enjoy traveling around the world where they help others, uh, help inspire others to a bigger life and legacy. In this episode, we're going to talk about a lot. We're going to talk about how to think much bigger than the circumstances you're in, what you should be asking for, and the best way to make that ask, the biggest challenges they face along the way, and how you can fast track the process of meeting your destiny. Before we begin, the right bit of inspiration can completely change the trajectory of someone life. So if there's a friend or loved one out there who needs to hear this episode or could use some help to win the day, share it with them right now. All right, let's win the day with Mark Victor Hansen and Crystal Dwyer Hansen. So great to see you. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Well, thank you, James. We are so excited to be here with you. <laughs> We've been looking forward to this. I mean, we had to set it up a long and <laughs> I'm sorry to say, but We've all bless been you for being patient. Hey, the timing worked out really well. So I'm it's really great. excited for all the things we're going to talk about today. Uh, Crystal, let's kick off with you. You were one of nine children. How did that experience teach you about the world and, and your role in the world? You know, I am so grateful for my upbringing. Of course, I don't know any different, but <laughs> I think growing up with nine children really socializes you in a different way. I think, you, well, I know you have to learn to make alliances, <laughs> right? <laughs> you have to learn to step up and speak up to be heard. And I think all of those things kind of prepare you for life in a way that um, maybe you don't get when you're just an only child. I mean, with nine children, there are no prima donnas. So <laughs> everyone was expected to like pull their weight, right? Everybody had to help. And, and you know, if you look at psychological studies, um, psych- psychologists will tell you what builds a child's self-esteem is their, and their sense of worth is their contribution to the family. If, if they really feel like they are an integral part of the family's functioning, that they feel they gain a sense of self-esteem that they don't otherwise get. And I'll tell you, my mother, I was the um, third child, second daughter, so I had a ton of responsibility. Um, but I think I grew up feeling like I could do anything after after everything we did. You know, I uh, my mom was kind of ahead of her time. She grew these gigantic organic gardens and she would make us work all summer in these things. And I'm like, oh, gosh, my friends are out having fun. But it taught me so much about responsibility. You know, I had to weed and pick and hoe. And also the fact that my mother would give so much of herself to create better health for us. I'm like, why are you doing this? Dad makes enough money. Go buy the stuff at the grocery store, <laughs> right? <laughs> but all of those lessons were so value to, valuable to me. Looking back, I'm just so grateful for all those experiences because they shaped me in a major, major way. Yeah, and the power of relationships. When we're talking about asking, there's obviously a person on the other side of that. So having a family is your ex- first exposure to team. 
That's and, right. And relationships more broadly. That's right. Right. Strategizing, figuring out how to ask and ask again and ask differently. Yeah, yeah, for <laughs> you sure. Know, to find the answer. And Mark, what about you? Is there a story of struggle or success from when you were younger that helped ultimately put you on the, the path that you went down? Boy, what a great question. Uh, my parents were Danish immigrants, totally loved our family, but didn't have much money because he owned a bakery and you make five cents a roll. So it's not like there's, and I didn't quite get that. I wanted a low handlebar racing bicycle. Dad took every cent he had and took us to what he called the old country. And I saw these racing bicycles back in 1957. I said, man, I got to have one. And I kept hitting them. And, and whatever I say, however many times he said no, which, you know, our, our friend here in L.A., Peter Goober, says, Mark, you're the most dyslexic guy ever. You thought he was saying <laughs> the whole time. Is it, is it I finally am reading a Boy Scout Life magazine that said you can sell greeting cards and consignment. With, I looked it up in my little dictionary. I said, hey, I can afford that. My mother was a great saleswoman. said, knock on the door, smile, wear your furry mitten and go like this. They'll bring you in and say, I'm earning my own bicycle. Would you like to invest in one box Christmas card or two? I sold the most greeting cards ever sold for American Green Card, 376 boxes in one month, got a dollar a box they sold for two. And a lot of people took two boxes, so I got $2 in a sale. So, And I bought my own bicycle come spring. My dad took half that money, put it in a college fund, but it got me to understand that I could sell my way rich, so to speak, to use Napoleon Hill, our, our mutual friend uh, and ancestral wisdom. And it just it just said, hey, wait a second, the rest of my life, I'm going to do something good in sales, marketing, speaking, and promoting. And, and so absolutely revectored me. One last thing, and that is, I was starting at nine. My parents didn't have money, so I had to buy all my own clothes, which I still do. And, <laughs> and it, it, it is like a great thing. How's that? <laughs> and did you, did you develop a love of selling or did you develop an understanding and knowledge of the process? So the work that you took now is what would get you the reward that you really wanted afterwards? I'd say both. And we're saying, you know, in our book on Ask, The Bridge from Your Dreams, Your Destiny, everyone's got a destiny. And the only way you get it is ask. And and what we got to do is ask, what is, God, what is your destiny for me? And you do it like 100 times before you go to sleep. Your mind will pop up an answer, but you got to be smart enough to have paper next to the bed or your computer and tell your spouse or spouse equivalent, you're going to write it down because it's going to come to you and it only comes once and it comes through in a quiet whisper is what God says. So you got to, you got to capture because it's like a wet slippery fish if you've ever been fishing you know they get away pretty quick so and and so we've done that but we've done it repetitively and that's why we keep on the ascent but i i believe everyone is here to have an abundant fulfilled fulfilled life Mm. speaking along that theme i wanted to know when you first saw your name on the new york times bestseller list for the first time and then 58 other times after that what did that process teach you about the power of manifestation? I've never been asked that question. That is wonderful. Uh, I think Jack and I thought, hey, wait, we've arrived. Because remember, we had 144 people. I jokingly say, they said, hit the road, Jack. Get out of here. <laughs> Jack, Jack lives in your neighborhood here. He's a wonderful guy. He's a genius, third in his class at Harvard. But he's the inside guy. I'm the outside guy. I'm the more, I'm an omnivert, but more extroversion and, and then introversion. And Jack's brilliant. That's not a question. And and did really well scholarship-wise and book-wise with me. Um, it, it, it made me tingle all over. I got goosebumps, God bumps, God uh, chili bumps, which is the first. We we do seven demarcations of what a chicken soup story does. That's the first. Second, it's got to cause instantaneous behavioral change. Wow! It 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 re it validated us in a way that nothing else could validate you because everybody should have a book. I, I wrote a whole book called "You Have a Book in You," and and it is the penultimate of experiences. Mm. Jeff Spencer, who came on this show, he said that the most prized possession for people these days is momentum. And it sounds like you just reached that tipping point of just having the momentum where then the opportunities that just get created from that are just through the roof. Obviously led to licensing and, and so many other, you know, foreign rights translations and all sorts of things. Yeah. And we were doing the second book after we did the first. So, and, and so we were the only book ever. We got three Guinness Book of Records out of just that by being number one 58 weeks in a row. And people would say, well, your second book is out on your first. Do you feel bad? I said, no, I can pay that both. Jack and I are in love with this whole process. Yeah. And then, you know, we did all those books. And since then, I've done 319 books and we're finishing more now. So, because it's an endless process. You're not 
There, I wrote a book with Art Linkletter, who you probably don't know, although he's an American, but traveled everywhere and did three TV shows. But he said, we said, don't retire, retire, put on new tires, go on a new, bigger, better, stronger, winning direction. Mm, it's like Sharon Lecker. She talks about rather than retire, refire was the big refire. thing for her. That's a good line. Yeah. We yeah. love Sharon, our neighbor in yeah. Arizona. Yeah. She's a good bud. She's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> I absolutely. Love Sharon. Your new book, Ask, is a phenomenal read. Uh, Thank you. What is the problem that you wanted to solve with the new book? And who do you want someone to be once they're finished reading? We wanted to give people one of the easiest tools that they already had inside of them that a lot of people miss, James. And when we broke it down, you know, because you see these people, they're so brilliant, they're talented, they've got great personalities, but they're kind of missing something. Why aren't they creating the life of their dreams? And so we kind of asked ourselves, what was it in our lives that kept us moving? We've been through, you know, turmoil, travails, challenges, both individually and together. And we thought if we had to boil it down to that one tool, what got us to that next step? What got us out of that problem? And it's really the ability to ask the right question at the right time in the right way that will deliver to you a new idea, a new solution, a new plan that you hadn't thought of before. And until you start asking, it doesn't happen because we tend to look at our outside world for direction. Instead of in going inside to our internal world to find the answers, and that's where the answers really are. So once we hit this this asking thing, we realize that's it. Mm -hmm. It's really about asking. And then we determine there are actually three channels through which you need to learn to ask, and those are ask yourself, ask others, and ask God, God, universe, whatever, however you think of God, the divine. And um, it was just a huge breakthrough for us that we, we knew we had to share it. Yeah. Is there a question from each of those channels that most people could use or are the questions deeply personal given the situation? There are so many thousands of questions that I can't isolate one, but I can tell you the asking yourself part is the reflective journey. You cannot know where you're going unless you know where you are. You have to go inside and start asking yourself those reflection reflective questions. Where am I? Is this working? Do I like this? Is there something I'm missing? And the more questions you ask, the more questions come to your mind. And of course, we always say, write them down. Write down your answers. Write down every answer that comes to you. The asking others part is the bonding journey. You cannot do this life alone. <laughs> As, and many of us think we, you know, too many people are trying to do life alone, especially in the digital world. We're isolated. We think we're connected by our phones, but we're really isolated. We need each other. So it's that bonding journey. When two people sit down and start asking questions of one another, the whole world opens up, right? You start to understand a person better and you understand yourself better. And so much can come out of that. And then, you know, the asking God part is really just about putting your life and your world into a much bigger context. Because part of the reason we get so miserable is we're putting our lives in such a small context, there's this big, bold, beautiful universe, and we're part of it. And we're, we are one of the miracles of this universe. We're one of the greatest miracles on earth, right? I mean, the ability to ask is something only humans have. No animal can ask a question. And, you know, if you look at scripture, which we love to do, it says we're created in the creator's image. Well, think about that. How do we create? We create by asking, by questioning, by probing, by being curious. And from that, a new idea can spring. Forth. I mean, if you think about it, every beautiful, amazing thing that's ever been created came from someone's imagination when they started asking questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the foundation of awareness. And what, what you're talking about here, this is the way that you succeed in business. It's the way that you succeed in friendship. It's the way that you succeed in, in mental health. Dr. Mark Goulston was on the show and he was we talking like about- We like Mark He's incredible, so isn't he? So fabulous. Sometimes you record an episode and you're just like, I wish everyone in the world could hear this one. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, please listen. Yeah. Such, yeah. A, such a lovely guy. Yes. And there's a really important thing I want to clarify now. Um, for people who are listening to this podcast and watching this, they think it's a burden to other people to ask them. But as the three of us know, just from talking before recording here, people are desperate to help others. But if yes. they don't know who you are and where you want to go and what they can help you with, then they're not going to be able to, to help you. That's right. And we we looked at a lot of studies about that. There are a bunch of studies on asking, as it turns out. And, and um, you know, turns out that people who stepped up and asked a question were 80% more likely to get their request granted, whether, you know, it's advice, information, help. But um, interestingly enough, the people going into the study believe just the opposite. 
that if they did ask something of someone that they would be perceived as being pushy, obnoxious, annoying. So we all are going into this life with the wrong perception that we shouldn't ask when it's exactly the opposite. Mm-hmm. You know, science proves we should be asking because it's very fruitful to ask. For sure. And that connection that it, that it builds. Yes. Uh, I always talk about the importance of turning yourself, uh, focusing on increasing value because the more valuable you are, the more value you have to give. And then I read in your book, the story of your grandson, Mark, who just said, I would like to be writing the story <laughs> for the next book. And you don't, you know, a young kid doesn't need to have built himself into value. He has no. the emotional connection and the right pitch and the results speak for themselves. And our little grandson, Everett, is an extraordinary kid. First of all, he's exceedingly bright and gifted and in gifted classes, but he's also an amazing basketball player. And his dad, who's our son, you know, says you got to, to begin with, if you're going to do basketball big, you've got to do a hundred hoops a day and hit it from a three pointer before you get paid a quarter at the end of the day. And he's only 11 years old <laughs> and you go, and a kid really does that. But I want to go back to the question you asked her and just to add one more, two more bits. One is one question asked can change your life from good to phenomenally good. That's one. Number two is that what what I learned early on when I was training in a life insurance business back in 1974, so we're talking about 50 years ago basically, is the size of your question determines size of your result. Yeah. When I asked, how do I make 100 grand a year? That's 250 work days times $400, 100 grand. Big money back then. Today, it's like almost a half million. But all of a sudden, I get with the world's best salesman, Ben Feldman. He sold, outsold 1,500 of the 1,800 insurance people he was with in New York. Like, became a good friend, you know, and talked with a lisp and was amazing. And I can tell you everything about him. But he said, hey, wait a second. If one of your kids, life's in line, can you earn $4,000 today? I get goosebumps with that question because he nailed it. Yeah. He said, now go do it, but then do it 250 times. Now you make a million a year, and then I start doing that because it's a size of your question. If you say, how am I going to do this? The mind at a very high level is teleological. That means it's goal setting and goal getting. So if you ask dumb questions, you get dumb results. If you ask wise questions, you get wise results. Financial questions, you get good financial results. Spiritual questions, you start to meet God in you and God in the universe. Because we think the universe is infinite and we're made in the infinite stuff of God. So we're here to create, contribute, and be charitable. Mm. Stoking urgency, I think, is an interesting thing that you sort of just touched on there. It's like, how do you make it something that you have to do right. rather than something that, yeah, you know, I sort of want to do this. I sort of want to make a little bit more money or I sort of want to be a, a better parent for my, my children. Mm-hmm. Having more urgency and desire around it has to be done. It, 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 you got to go from want, I want this, to I want it so bad, so uh, white, white hot desires, what Dr. Hill talked about mm-hmm. and Think and Grow Rich in all of his books. And it, when you got white hot desire, you go out and accomplish the impossible. And the opening line, as you probably know, is, is Edward C. Barnes walks up, shakes his hand, said, meet your new partner. Do you know who Edward C. Barnes became? Mm-hmm. This is critical because I read <laughs> everything about Edward C. Barnes. He yeah, owned t- half of General Electric. Yeah, Thomas Edison's partner. Just cause, yeah. Yeah, 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 just because yeah. he shook his hand and said, I'm going to do it. But he was mm-hmm. basically the inside guy. Every company needs an inside guy and an outside guy. And the mm-hmm. Chicken Soup Series, I'm more of the outside guy than Jack. And Jack's more of the inside guy and did a brilliant job. But, you know, in, in Crystal Mark relationship, more often than not, I'm the outside person, although she can really handle the outside stuff and is more <laughs> beautiful to look at. And, and, and everybody wants to say, I don't need you at all, but I like talking yeah. to her. Mark, you can go and wait outside. <laughs> Speaking of thinking, Great Rich, a, and the challenge for me as an interviewer, you've both done thousands and thousands of interviewers. So coming up with the right questions is always a bit of a, a, bit of a challenge. But speaking of thinking, Grow Rich, the question I wanted to ask you both is what is the biggest adversity that you have faced individually that you have been able to identify an equivalent or greater benefit in? We know there are stories of people like Jim Stovall, another mutual friend of ours, who went on to create the Narrative Television Network. Mm -hmm. There are so many stories of adversity, and I was wondering if if either of you have one that really stands out. Yeah, I mean, I think my my biggest story of adversity was when I... um, I, high school was very easy for me. I, um, I graduated myself early um, at age 16 because I, I found it to be very, very boring and easy. <laughs> and I married my boyfriend who was five years older. Um, it turned out not to be a great life plan <laughs> because two and a half years later, I was divorced um, in a city all by myself, baby on my hip, and honestly had no idea what I was going to do. So... Um, but it forced me to get out there because I had no options. There was that urgency that we were talking about. 
So um, I remember standing in the line at the grocery store getting ready to turn over food stamps for groceries and diapers, right? Because that's all I could think of. I got to get some food stamp. I can't, I can't survive. So um, something hit me, a question dropped into my mind, sort of like, how did I get here, first of all? And then honestly, James, I heard this voice in my mind saying, are you doing the best you can? Are you taking the easy way out? And I don't know if it was God or my grandfather who was deceased, but it was like, boom, busted. I knew I wasn't. I knew I wasn't doing my best. This was not my best. I, I realized that in that second, I had an instant pivot and I didn't even know what my best was. But I went home and I said, I will never, I didn't even finish using the food stamps. I said, I'm never doing that again. <laughs> and, but, but I realized I didn't have answers, but I had questions. So I started asking, who would hire me? What can I do? How can I get out there tomorrow and make money? The second I started asking those questions, I remembered hearing this radio ad come and get work tomorrow, you know, temporary services, Kelly services. I call them up. I'm, I said, how do I apply? They had me fill out the paperwork. They start sending you on these jobs. You can say yes or no. And I started doing all these different jobs and learning so much about small business. I was like all kinds of things, you know, working at conventions, setting up booths at malls, working in small, you know, but lawyers offices, um, working for small business owners. And I learned so much about myself and about that them. And I realized I was so fascinated with small business. Like, what? You just you just got an idea and you started this business? And I thought that was so eye-opening to me. And so I really, I started realizing, you know, some of the skills and talents that I had. I was pretty good at sales, you know? I'm like, hey, I'm selling a lot here. <laughs> so I decided to put myself through real estate school, which I did. So uh, in the meantime, someone approached me and said, you should do some modeling. And by that, at that point, I'd gotten to the point where I'm like, why not? I'm going to go ask. <laughs> I have nothing to lose, right? So I walked in and kind of faked my way down the runway, acted like I knew what I was doing, read some lines, you know, like for commercial work. And uh, they signed me, which was amazing. So literally a year and a half from that moment where I was turning the food stamps over for food and diapers, I'm now working as a licensed realtor to, for the top home builder in our valley. And I became the number one realtor, crazily. And at the same time, I had done a couple of uh, commercial jobs where uh, television commercials that went national, international, actually. So at that point, I had to join what Screen Actors Guild, right? Because you, once you book enough money, you, they invite you to join the union, which is great. So I joined and um, they sent me this packet one day and I it was the best insurance benefits available on the planet. I am not kidding you. So my my son and I had total coverage, 100% for everything, no extra premiums. And I would often think about that moment where it would have been so easy to cascade down into my victimhood. Because I was young. I had every reason. Like, I'm young. No one's helping me. Wah, wah, wah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm like, I am so thankful that that question dropped in my mind. Are you doing the best you can? Are you taking the easy way out? And I didn't like that feeling. Mm. So it revectored me in a huge way. And, and it created that movement as well, which was created the movement. Yeah. yeah which enables those other things. And, and yeah. something I really uh, picked up on from your story, it's an Oprah Winfrey quote that I heard recently. Now this is not it verbatim. I wish I had it. I'll put it over the, the video version. Right. Oprah mentions that if you underestimate your station in life, people are going to underestimate your character. Yes, And it sounds like absolutely. from the moment you made the decision that you never underestimated your character again. Never again. Mm. I just went, I, everything went straight up from there mm. because I made such a firm decision. And that's what asking the right question can do for you. Yeah. You know, and, and like Mark was saying, ask the right questions. Ask big enough questions. You're ask, if you're asking questions like, am I going to get sick next month? Oh, am I going to get the flu? Do I feel, you know, all these things that can be, basically, if you think of questions, as a vessel, your question is the vessel your life is going to pour into you. So make sure it's the vessel that you want, right? Mm -hmm. Ask really powerful questions and do it through your imagination. What we say is on that ask yourself part, there are really three phases, three critical phases. Where am I now? Where do I want to be? And in that phase, where do I want to be? Do it from your imagination, the nth degree of your greatest imagination for yourself. Okay, no one's holding you back. No one can stop you from imagining every perfect thing for your life. So start there. Imagine in my perfect relationship, what are we doing? What is what does my love interest look like? 
what is is our life an adventure? Are we traveling? How do we speak to each other? How do how are we with each other? Is it fun? Imagine all the greatest things. Ask the questions from the greatest point of your imagination, and then all the answers will start to fill in. Same thing with your career. Imagine yourself at the peak of your career. Who are you speaking to? Who are your colleagues? What do you? How are you spending your time? How are you serving? How many people are you impacting? Right. The biggest nth degree of your biggest imagination. So create that vessel and then ask those questions from the bigger vessel. And you will engineer yourself, engineer your life, your greatest life backwards Mm -hmm. by asking those questions. It's it's a remarkable process. What I've created through that process, which is interesting because even sitting down with the two of you today, I grew up in Brisbane, Australia and moved over here where I basically mm-hmm. didn't know anyone. Wow. And the things that have been created and manifested in my life already, as I'm as I continually do that process, once yeah. a year I have a very rigorous process for how I do that and I check in quarterly and I look at it daily. It is beyond my imagination now, the things. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the things that I want, the people I want to connect with. It's it's I, I'm amazing. almost at the point of being beyond that. But you have to start. You have to start to do that process, and then yes. the abundance. The, the point that that reaches, where you're like, can sit down, and there is not a single person on the planet where you can say, you know what, Elon Musk is like a three year goal. A billion social media views is like a three year goal, rather than right. these things that would be like nice to achieve that once in your life. Yeah. Um, I think that's really, really interesting. Mark, what about you? What is the biggest adversity you faced? You were able to identify an equivalent or greater benefit in? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I love the question, and, and I think every one of us got to take adversity, turn it into advantage. So mm-hmm. it's 1974. I've been in graduate school with arguably the smartest guy that the planet at that time, I think, Dr. R. Buckminster Fuller. I mean, Einstein's best student. He explained E equals MC squared, so everyone understood it. Fifteen doctorates at Harvard. And anyhow, I get spend seven years with him, and then I, I say, well, I'm supposed to go do a bucky, didn't I? I'm building the Wall Street Racket Club, Botanical Gardens, geodesic domes out of plastic, polyvinyl chloride at exactly the wrong time in history because Monsanto was my supplier. <laughs> I'm 26, and I'm on top of the world doing $2 million a year, but I'm doing $40,000 a month with a plastic oil company product. And uh, Monsanto said, look, there's an oil uh, shortage and crisis and you aren't big enough, you're out of business. And then one day I was from being rich, successful and thinking I was a who to being a nobody and I had to go bankrupt. I went bankrupt <laughs> so fast. I had to go to the New York Public Library and check out a book, How to Go Bankrupt by Yourself. <laughs> you got like an awkward look on your face as you're checking this. Right. Yeah, it's not for me, it's for a friend of mine. Uh, yeah, you're right. I didn't think of that. I'm on the, uh, in the oh, Eastern Court, I'm on the court steps waiting to go in and a lawyer is hustling for business and this is 1974 and he says, Look, guy, I'll take you bankrupt for three hundred dollars. I looked at him. I said, "If I had three hundred dollars, I wouldn't be going bankrupt." Anyhow, you know, you get the guy in the black robes hit down the gavel, and I feel like nothing. I feel trash, and for six months, I'm sleeping in front of another guy's room in a sleeping bag at a hundred dollars a month in Hicksville, Long Island, New York. So I'm not sni- styling, and I'm not profiling. <laughs> no, and and we ask three questions. We said, "Ask yourself, ask others, ask God." So I, I go to, you know, to get rid of the noise. You got to do one question. We say 101 times, and the question for me is, God, what's your destiny for me? 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 God comes through bold and says, what do you want to do? And I go, what? (laughs) You're supposed to talk to me. I'm not supposed to tell you. I I read the Bible. You told Moses and all the big guys what to do. Anyhow, so you don't argue with Big G. That's not like a smart (laughs) idea. So I said, look, I want to talk to people that care about things that matter that make a life-changing difference. Now, talk about getting re-vectored fast. I go down to breakfast with my three roommates. We're probably having eggs. And I say, hey, you guys know anyone young that's that, – so I could relate to them because I, I said, I don't want a Broadway star. I don't want a celebrity, mm-hmm. not a doctor, a lawyer, or a cotton top like I am today, a white-haired person <laughs> for some people listening and not able to see this on video. And uh, they say, oh, man – I sell real estate, and this guy's just phenomenal. And remember, this is when interest rates at 19%. And some people haven't borrowed money up to 28%. So real estate's not working. He gives me a ticket to the um, uh, multi-listing uh, MLS, uh, and I rush out. Wow. This guy's talking to Hop Hog Long in New York, 500 people, Chip Collins. And he wows the audience. When I came in, they're despondent, disconsolate, angry, pissed off, uptight, nothing going right. And I'm sitting in the back going... There's no way this guy can turn them. I get goosebumps telling you that. And the guy totally turned them over the next three hours. At the end of which, I go up and I ask. 
I said, Chip, I'm Mark Victor Hansen. I'd like to take you to lunch. And his voice is burned out. We did not have good microphone in 1974. It didn't exist. There's no lavaliers, none of that stuff <laughs> that we take for granted. So right? you're shouting to hit the, hit yeah, the back of the room. Shouting, right, and exactly. luckily, I was in the back of the room, and I could hear loud and clear, and I love what he's saying. <laughs> Right? And he said, what do you want, kid? His voice was burnt out. And I said, I want to do what you do. He said, ah, look, chance of you making it one in a thousand, you ain't going to do it, so go do something. I got choked up trying to mimic what he did that day. <clears throat> I said, let me make the decision. I'll buy your lunch. Long story short, he said, look, I own the real estate market in five boroughs. You can't have it if I'll teach you, but you cannot do the real estate. I said, okay. What do I do? He said, the life insurance business, bottomless fit for motivation. If you really want to go through a lot of pain and suffering, go do that. <laughs> school, and he said, yeah, tough school. <laughs> yeah, he said, here's the four questions, prospecting, presenting, good work habits, and closing. You figure out how to teach it, but go and sell the $25 each, sell four seminars at once, and go to the general age or manager. I didn't own any life insurance. <laughs> I didn't know what a premium was. I, I, I sure said didn't have any money to buy and had taken everything from me. So I, I got this little Barely $400 pitted window permanently air conditioned Volkswagen. And I'm driving and parking two blocks away and I only got one sport coat and I look pretty disheveled. He said, you call on 10 and one will buy. Well, the 10th one at 630 at night, there's a Cadillac out in front of this little office a big office actually and i go in and there's nobody there except the owner or manager as it turned out and he's a big heavy italian guy and we just really hit it off and i thought oh thank you god and he said okay i'll take it kid i said chip had taught me one closing question do you want to cut the check or have your secretary cut it <laughs> he looked at me he laughed and said i'm a big boy i can cut it how much is it? i said 100 bucks because we, you Seems start like under market, money. 25, and then we went to 50, and then 250, and now I get 35 grand. I talk low, uh, in, domestically and 75 <laughs> internationally, but you got to do three if I'm going to a foreign country because we just we can insist on anything we want. I don't want to go unless we get to do that and then travel and have fun. Long story short, Chip and I became mastermind partners. Andrew Carnegie's last two things, uh, he taught Napoleon Hill that he had a mastermind. He found a mastermind when he had 12 disciples, Jesus Go in the same direction. That's when he created water into wine in Canaan. And he said, wait a second, I guess that's the number I got to have. So he got, he got obviously Charlie Schwab, great, great grandfather. He got Frick, who I hope you've been to the Frick Museum when you go to New York and all that. Blew me away the first time I saw that in Art Appreciation 101. I love this. I, I didn't realize or think I'd ever get to see the greatest art in the world owned by these guys. And be, you know, anyhow, long story short, Chip and I mastermind every week, Tuesday morning at 7.30 in the morning. I got 12 together. I got the biggest minister with 5,000 at his congregation mini, meeting with us ahead of Chase Bank. Amazing that I got all these people. But when I got out of the mastermind, Napoleon Hill was taught at Andrew Carnegie's house in New York that you'll build a third new mind. Yeah. Today, we know we can take an auric picture. It's called Curlium Photography, the Russian stuff. You emanate out. And, 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 and you know, a lot of people teach that they're sold before you get there. Well, boy, after those meetings at 730 in the morning to 9 o'clock, if I got, I had stacked my meetings because everybody bought. I mean, it just, you just mowed them over because you were invincible. You were unstoppable. And that's really what Andrew Carnegie did because you cheer on your team and then your team cheers you on. And pretty soon... Anyone who gets in front of you, they're done for. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what happened. And, and and obviously, I've never stopped. And then I taught that to Jack. And then Chris and I have obviously participated in that. And we're just, we could not be more happy to be together. Yeah. It's it's rare to have a book title that you can feel. And I feel like Chicken Soup for the Soul, oh, yeah. maybe more than any other book in history, you can actually feel that. How important, obviously, the, the content is phenomenal too, but how important is people being able to understand and have an emotional connection just from seeing or uh, seeing the title? We say the title has got to be the elo emotional logic that seals the deal in consciousness. Chicken soup, obviously, is what grandma and mom gave you when you're sick to get well, and they put their hand on your hot little head and said, oh, it's too bad to you, sick, James. We're going to make you well, <laughs> right? Or whatever grandma or mom or dad I'll says. take chicken soup when I'm, uh, when I'm healthy. I'll take right, it all right. the time. It. <laughs> but it, it, it's universal. It's, it, we yeah. sold 374 million books in China, and, and Campbell's paid me a fortune to go through trying to convince everybody <laughs> in China to buy just one can of soup because they have soup every day in China because they don't have a lot. And, and you can thin almost anything with soup, and soup's pretty good for you. Anyhow, uh, not enough protein probably, but be that as it may. So the way Jack and I did it, Jack and I had a, had a little title that we weren't happy with. 
And I said, Jack, we're going to use this principle of you go into the deeper mind. And, and Napoleon Hill, as you know, original book title was How to Make a Boodle with Your Noodle. He told his <laughs> publisher, and the publisher did what you're doing. Going, yeah. <laughs> that's, how, that's how close he was to not having a whole Think and Grow Rich movement oh, because of a title. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really? Yes. Truly? So, so Napoleon crazy. Hill did that same thing. In, in, in psychiatry, mm-hmm. guys like Dr. Goulson will call it a thought command, mm-hmm. where a hundred times Napoleon Hill said, best-selling title. But Jack and I said, mega best-selling title, mega best-selling title. In our respective homes, 101 time. Jack calls me up. This is before cell phones. This is 1989. And the phone rings, and, and at the time, my little daughter's becoming a veterinarian. We got 88 animals in one acre in Newport <laughs> Beach. I'm making a lot of money as a speaker, but boy, when the phones ring, there are like four phones going, <laughs> and, and all the chickens wake up, all the animals, the four dogs are barking. I go, My wife said, This had better be damn good. And I yeah. go, Oh boy. And I, I say, Yeah, Jack says, Chickens, I said, For the soul. And, and both of us got goosebumps. We yeah. knew that we had the title because we'd commanded. God in us to give us a title. And most people don't command their deeper, innermost 18 billion brain cells to make the decision so the subconscious can work in a provision. We're too t- screwed up reading our cell phone, watching our computer, <laughs> listening to the problems of our kids or our spouse or our boss or our clients or whatever mm-hmm. it is. And we don't get, you know, the, what the Bible says, Crystal Clear, get still and know that I'm God. The first book she wrote, which I wrote the endorsement to, Seventh Principles. You got to get still. You got to have quiet time. And and today we have the busiest lives unequivocally in the world. I don't think you'll disagree. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So the process of uncluttering the mind is huge. I had a situation last year where when our second kid was born, he had a whole host of health issues. Nothing, nothing too bad now. Um, a lot of respiratory challenges, yeah. waking up four times a night oh, for like a whole year. Really and that's a horrible year so with two working difficult. parents. And oh, yeah, you're yeah. going through that. And then I was right. lying in bed one night. And it's funny the why I believe so much about the right questions, not just for the results that it's created for me. Mm -hmm. But I'm now at a point in my life where the intuition will put the question in my mind. And that was a really interesting thing. I was lying in bed one night and it said, are these things that I'm involved in, is that your path? And then the answer came to me before I could consciously process the question. It just said, no, it's not. And that was the decision for me to get out of all of the things that I was in to create space, which led to me going all in on the win the day movement, which is now since that moment, everything has gone. Actually that morning, the morning after I, I had that thought and I made that decision, I had a friend of mine that said, would you like to connect with Mark Victor Hanton? And I said, yes. And you, <laughs> and you called me. You called me that, that day. And I, um, I remember it vividly. I was in my backyard. I was making breakfast wow. for my kids. And I'm like, when Mark Victor Hanson calls, you, you answer. And I picked it up. And that was the first of three amazing things that happened that day, which was a sign from the universe that I had made the right decision. And I'll never forget that. Well, and you'd just been thinking about him. I mean, James, that's mm-hmm. the thing that's so powerful for me is the power of our thoughts and intentions are huge. That's why that that quiet time is so important, because that is the time you're creating. That's creation time. And the minute you allow yourself that stillness, look what happens when you listen. That's why the asking God part is so important. It's like opening up to everything that that you can connect with. Absolutely. And then that connected to this man. I mean, it's yeah. like it's like you're literally shooting out energy and it's connecting to other people, other events. Yeah. That's what Dr. Hill said, is that you're a broadcasting and receiving station, but an yeah. intuition is a wellsprings of wisdom, mm-hmm. but it's only the wellsprings when you go deeper into the these this gigantic amount of consciousness, which is, I think it goes conscious, subconscious, super conscious, God conscious, or cosmic conscious. We, like she said early in the discussion today, we, it doesn't matter. God doesn't care what you call him as long as you talk to him, right? <laughs> I, or at least that's how I feel. Like you know, some people are pretty uh, uh, obnoxious about the way well, you got to call it the way I call it. Well, uh, good for you, right? There's 367 <laughs> names for Big G, and I, don't, I think he, he knows all of them because he created the Tower of Babel, right? So the, I never said that before, but the, I think it's correct. Is it? Is it? You you did it, and it had to do it because you were sending it out. And the vibratory. There's only one universe. There's one mind, and one mind is really connected. But if you've got all that interference of normal life, the dog is barking, the kids are crying, the your kid in this case was sick and waking up four times a night, making you sleepless, which at some levels is an adversity that has you helped to break through. Yeah, absolutely. And thank God you healed your kid. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Crystal, out of all the people that you've worked with, is there a specific method that you take them through or, or any specific questions that you like to ask them to help get them unstuck so they can move into a more meaningful place? Yeah, and it's very individual. You know, it depends on what their issue is, but it's really about um, doing an intake to try to understand 
when they first started experiencing what they're experiencing. Because going back in time and trying to find, um, you know, triggering events that sort of led them to those conclusions. And sometimes they're very obvious. Like, you know, I had a client, um, Kathy, who was severely abused and she woke up every day. She heard me on the radio on a show and she said, you're my last hope. I wake up every day thinking I, I need to die, that I, I shouldn't be alive, that I don't have the right to be alive. Well, she grew up, you know, during the depression. Depression. Her family was very, very poor. Her mother was mentally ill. She remembers some horrifying things. Um, like one day that she said her mother picked her up by the ankle, swirled her around and threw her into the refrigerator. Then she remembered her dad, mother left, never saw her again. Dad rounded up the kids a few weeks later, put them in the truck dropped them off at the relatives and said, I can't deal with these girls. You take them. So then she stands there and the aunts and uncles are saying, well, we'll take the little baby. She needs a lot of love, the two-year-old. And we'll take the four-year-old. You know, we have another four-year-old they can play. And then everyone's looking at her like, we can't, we, we can't, we don't have enough money to feed another mouth. So they're like arguing like no one wanted her. So her sense of unworthiness was just so profound. Um, so it was easy in that case. Obviously we knew where to start, but usually we all have these stories that we come from and uh, that we repeat to ourselves. That we repeat to ourselves. Yeah. And that, that was a very profound sense of rejection. So you can see how she would be left with this uh, sense of unworthiness that was so deep and so profound. Yeah. Um, but what we really did is what I like to do is really try to separate our identities. So when we have these experiences, we start to identify with that. I'm not worthy. Or I am depressed. I am anxious. And we give ourselves these labels. We name ourselves. And when you name yourself with I am, you are giving yourself, you are re-upping that title for yourself again and again and again. And, you know, our lives will go where we're looking. And if, if that's what you're calling yourself, that's where you're looking. That's where you're going to stay. So we really, the first thing I do is separate from the identity and realize no matter how bad those things were, those were situations, circumstances that were probably beyond your control, things that happened in life. And even if you did participate as an older person, you made some mistakes or whatever, those are that's part of your journey. It's not who you are. It's part of your experience. It's not who you are. It's not your name. And so really disidentifying and just saying, that's an experience. It is not me. Now, where do I want to create from? So really coming to that, purging all of that, the past neutralizing it so you don't carry the emotional burden of it because it is just the past. It is not who you are and it's not who you need to be. And then coming to that zero point where you say, okay, what do I want to create? Where do I really want to go? Because I get to do that in this life. I can re-vector my thought patterns. I can claim a new identity for myself. I can claim a new name, you know, and, um, and I mean, I, I, I don't mean a new name, change your name, but you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. just decide I am a successful person. I am a worthy person. So declare those things over yourself and and create a new story for yourself. Mm. And um, it's so powerful. You can literally, I will tell you, James, she, she wrote to me after five appointments and she said, I just have to thank you for coming into my life. She said, I can honestly say I'm completely free of the crushing depression I have experienced my entire life. Now I can just wake up and have a bad day, and it's just a bad day. It's just a situation. It's a nice email to receive. Yeah, yeah. No, there's <laughs> nothing better. There's nothing yeah. better than to be able to help another human being and help, you know, I, the way I would describe it, it's like people would co come to me, you know, and I see like the dirt, the mud that got caked up. Maybe they've even eaten some of it. It's like deep inside of them. And I love just like helping them wash that clean to see that beautiful, shining human being who's ready to express. For someone who's in very humble beginnings or in a really tough environment or maybe a negative environment around some toxic people, how can they think so much bigger above the circumstances that they're in? The best way is to understand, you know what, love and forgiveness is huge. And that was a huge part for Kathy. I said, you know, we, I took her through this process. Imagine what it's like to be that person. That person, even if they're violent, horrible, mean, they are suffering so dramatically. They are in their own living hell. And whatever happened to them before you came along is very, very sad. It can't be good. 
right? And they, believe it or not, they're doing the best they can from their own state of consciousness. They're in a very, very bad place. And it honestly has nothing to do with you. We personalize everything. We think they're doing this to me because I'm bad, because I'm not worthy of love, because I don't deserve anything good. That's not true. There's no truth to that. It's completely because of them. So we we really just have to neutralize that emotional connection and stop personalizing it and have compassion for that person. Compassion is huge. Compassion and forgiveness. How sad, we started going through an exercise like, how sad must it be to be your mom? The turmoil, she, the, the lack of love, the lack of control. And she was able to completely let go and realize that how her mom behaved had nothing to do with her worthiness, nothing at all. So it's it's so freeing. It's so that. She's liberating the already. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Uh, getting around the right people has been huge for the the three of us. How yes. can people start the process of finding like minded people, and how can they help each other go forward to becoming people of influence? First book I really wrote was called Future Diary, and in Future Diary I said you got to write down a list of two hundred people you want to spend time with meet, grow with, and be expanded by, and expand them if you can. And today, not only can you do that, but with your little cell phone, you take your picture and put it next to their picture. And you can put down anyone. I mean, we spent invited by Richard Branson, you know, down to his island. And a guy's, you know, he owns 421 companies worth so. seven or $8 billion. I mean, and we just had a, he hugged her and didn't want, he didn't care to hug me, but he really <laughs> got off on my Mark, you can say on the boat. <laughs> Take my so wife, funny. please. But I wasn't doing that, so right? Funny. That old joke in line from Rodney Dearfield. But I've got, there's nobody I haven't gotten to meet. And, and the yeah. spiritual principles, which are taught in our book, Ask, are figure out what you want, right? That you definite major purpose. Number two, it's got to be in writing. This is spiritual language. Write a thing, make it clear, it'll be established onto you. Third, right. you got to visualize to realize. you got to see it to make it happen. Sort of like your intuition had you see the answer to your kid's sickness. Or in our case, mm -hmm. we see, you know, at the front end with Chip Collins, I, I said, you know, he said, start telling everyone I am a professional speaker, meaning you're going to get paid for speeches and only Tony Robbins, as far as I know, did a thousand speeches a year for the first three years of our business because I had nothing else to do. So I'd be talking at six, ten, two, and, and eight o'clock at night because I was I was digging it and loving it, still <laughs> love it. And then and then number okay, so you got to figure out what you want, put it in writing, visualize, realize, it, and I got a book out on that and tapes out, of course. And then and then you got to have a mastermind. You got to have a team to get your dream, and team means together everyone accomplishes miracles because there are miracles like she was saying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And and then I said yeah. after starting to write books and everybody wanted my signature, I said, I'm going to become world's best-selling author. And as far as I know, no one else ever wrote that down, said it. And I was obviously, there's two ways when you set a goal, because a goal is a preview of future events, is you tell no one, which is if you're afraid that you're not going to do it, you don't tell anyone. Because remember, I said, you got to go from want to will. Or or if you're bodacious and outrageous like I am, you tell everybody, this is what I'm going to do. I don't know how I'm going to do it. <laughs> I mean, and right now we got a lot of bodacious guys out there. we got Elon Musk doing stuff that's wonderful. And seven companies be the first trillionaire. I've got a whole set of YouTube tapes on him. One on Jordan Peterson who's trying to put together the anti-Davos stuff. One, you know, Patrick Bet David who's gone from zero to a billion in 10 years. Nobody's done that now. In the next five years, according to Steve Forbes, who we've met with and met and talked to a lot, but Steve Forbes says we're going to have a hundred, hundred billion dollar companies because of AI, which you just, that means a lot of people are going to get rich. <clears throat> and what that really means is my teacher, Bucky Fuller, said, look, Christ said in John 10, 10, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And he could see the future because, you know, God's eternal, sees the Alpha and the Omega. But he did, and obviously he saw the technology would uh, allow everyone to, we're going to have more than enough food so we don't have to worry about what Malta said. You know, we can have more than enough water. We can now pull out of the air with instantaneously with condensation, all kinds of cool stuff called source water. You can do all these things that we couldn't do before. So we can literally take care of 8 billion and grows to 12 billion. And every person that comes out, according to Julian Simon, uh, he's a great economist, University of Chicago. He said more population means more abundance, not less. Mm -hmm. It's 180 degrees from what the idiots are saying that we got to cut the population. We got really big name people who are going to go on name now, say we should have 500 million. Well, we got 8 billion of us. That's like 116, and they're wrong. And they're a disaster trying to make it happen. And so what I'm saying is, hey, wait a second. I'm going to hold up the mirror. You look at it and say, hey, doesn't this make sense to have really good kids, have great loving relationship? 
teach your kids all the principles and then let's make sure that everybody's better off and no one's worse off. Mm. Sounds like a good plan, doesn't it? There's so much division these days, but if you break it right down, most people essentially want the same thing. We do. Yeah, yeah. We do. So it's it's projected on us that we're believing the lies. It's media. They, they try to divide us. I yeah. mean, it, it's it it's handy for politicians, for politics. Mm. To divide people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, we just can't fall for it. For sure. We, we really do want the same things. Yeah. There's and, more than enough. Absolutely. When I, I was a student ambassador, as you know, to India and, and at the Harvard of India and all that. But I got to go to Mahatma Gandhi's houses and stay hang there because nobody else thought about that. And I did. And this is 1968. So his, his major quote, as far as I'm concerned, which is unknown, is on the wall. It says, there's enough for everybody's need not enough for anyone's greed. Mm. And so we got a lot of people that are that are greedy and and now we own a publishing company called Mark Victoranson Library dot com and we're 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 Alexander the Great publishing one point and then and then Andrew Carnegie's two point with two thousand five hundred and nine libraries. I just looked that up this morning and he said you've got to make the library grow by ten percent a year and all that. I can tell you all that stuff, but you know, then third, we're library 3.0, where we now have the technology for the first time in human history to get to 8 billion people and mean they can learn in their awareness. Like we've got a guy brought to us an AI product that can take everybody's voice like this broadcast instantaneously translate it 98 percent accurate into Swahili, Japanese, four kinds of Spanish. And you go, wow, everybody can can have a book auditorially because not everybody's going to learn to read at the front end. But then you got. Elon Musk gave a hundred million dollars to Dr. Peter Demandis. I don't know if you had Peter on or not, but Peter's a genius and wrote abundance. It is a great guy, and I met him a few times. But Peter went in and in ninety days took people in Kenya, totally illiterate, nine hundred kids, brought them all to literacy and math and reading. Now, if we can do that in ninety days, we can emerge out of illiteracy because my cliche is you got to read to be freed, and we're talking about mm-hmm. being comprehensively freed, have money freedom, time freedom, relationship freedom, and most importantly, what you're teaching and your thing. If you don't mind my sh- shutting it down for you, is is how to be passionately and purposeful about your life and what your mission is and what you're going to accomplish. Because each of us has what Crystal said to you a minute ago, a divine accomplishment in front of us. It can't be behind us because you can't change yesterday. We can only go into the future. And and that's why we live mentally is what are we trying to accomplish? And we got stacks of stuff we want to do. But I think that's what makes love life, life and love fun. and, and yeah. life. <laughs> life loving and yeah, life you love. <laughs> so true. Well, speaking of, speaking of love, after going through divorce, what did that teach you about what you should look for in the right partner. Oh, it's so interesting you'd ask this because right now we have been asked by a guy who owns 150,000 hours of radio time in the United States to put together a marriage program. Amazing. Yeah. Who better to do it than you two? I love the, right. the love story. It's amazing. It's the best part of your journey. I oh, think. thank you. We think it is too. It's it's quite <laughs> miraculous. And there were so many supernatural elements and that came into that. And I guess you have to read the book because there's a lot to it. But um. <laughs> Yeah, when we started asking for what we really wanted, because yes, our first marriages provided a contrast to us, what doesn't work. But then, you know, once we met each other, kind of God delivered us to each other. We still had to do the work. We still had to, I think, and this is what we really want people to understand is you have to work on a a mutual value system because you think you come back together and you think everything's just going to come together, right? But you come with your own baggage to the marriage. Everyone does. So one of the processes, looking at your own baggage, you know, what's your old MO that you default to, you know, those things that, that can shut marriage down, right? That can sabotage marriages. And it's funny when you, when you talk to marriage counselors, marriage psychologists, I think they all agree that when marriages fail, it's kind of a death by a thousand paper cuts, you know, it's all these little things that we didn't think mattered. So it's so important to sit down and look at your baggage and be willing to get rid of it. Is this going to serve my marriage or not, right? And if if we're going to create this, what we call this amazing calling, you know, the one flesh relationship, because you are becoming one flesh. You do become one, just, you know, like it says in Genesis. I mean, it's pretty cool when you think about that. It's a very big calling. And so I think if we took it more seriously, that's what we're talking about, is really taking that privilege and, and, and that honor, um, you know, with with more responsibility and and doing the work that it that it takes to create a beautiful marriage 
really come to get, coming together on your value system. Mm. It does take work, doesn't it? Everyone thinks you're going to, it's like resilience. You can't click your fingers no. and be resilient for the rest of your no, life. No, it takes deliberate mm. energy and forth and, and really working through some, some things. And you think you have the same values, but when you sit down, it's like all these little things. What are the things that I value? What are the things you value? You know, and really coming together with a combined set, a combined value system for this marriage, mm. because, you know, you're like a new entity, right? Yeah. Together. And so. you have to grow individually and support the other person yes. in their individual things. Yes. How do you two manage that in terms of being able to support individual ambition and keep the union so so strong? You know, I think we really love that the other person has their own qualities and traits. We really respect and honor that. Like I love Mark and who he is and what he what he does. And I think we have this time around, you know, I think we both have a, a lot of emotional maturity in that sense. Like neither of us is threatened by, you know, the other one. So he loves the things that I can do on my own and bring to our marriage that are a great value to both of us. And I love the things that he can do and bring to the marriage. And then when we combine those, it's better than ever. And we don't, we realize we're different. I mean, sometimes those differences, you know, if we're in a bad mood or we're tired, <laughs> we're tired, we'll bump up against each other like all couples. But we usually start laughing about it and we usually go, OK, we, got, we need to knock this off. We're just like going down a stupid path um, because we're cranky. Yeah. Um, Before coffee and food, usually. Yeah, that's that's yeah, what my exactly. household is at its absolute lowest. Once we've had coffee and food, sleep, right? We're yes. lacking sleep like at the end of the day when we've had huge, heavy projects <laughs> and we're just like burned out. Yeah. So it's like, OK, quiet time. Let's go yeah. into some quiet time, reflective yeah. time, you know. So, um, yeah, but it's, it's, it's worth it. That's what I would say. You become much bigger in a marriage than you can be on your own. That's the truth. It takes a very mature person to be in a marriage. You know, even Jesus said that. He basically said marriage isn't for everyone, but kind of when you accept that that calling, it, it's a very big calling. And, the, and you know, the, the rewards are great. I'm paraphrasing, but but they are. Because if you think about it, you have this complete, I mean, you know, man – and women are are pretty much made for each other. I mean, we we do bring different different strengths to the table, mm -hmm. and um, that can be a great strength in life. It really helps build a, a solid foundation for your life. That's that's hard to duplicate just on your own. Mm. Do you Align, agree? Do you agree? Absolutely, alignment yeah. of values, but complementary skill sets. Yes. Yeah, I yeah. think. And, really and I think the other thing is you got to see more in the other person than they see in themselves. So they back to your question about growth. Growth is a mandate of every person, but most people get stifled or stopped. It's easiest to look at it financially and they say, well, if I make a hundred grand a year, then I'm bigger. I make a quarter million or a million or 10 million, whatever the no there's some number. And then you stop and you say, I'm done. No, no, you don't get to be done because there's other people that can't get served unless you serve. Now, the same thing here in, in our relationship is our relationship has, has built and, and because I went through a very painful, expensive divorce. I wrote down 267 things I needed, and then I had a lot of non-negotiables. She can't be an alcoholic. She can't smoke because I don't want to kiss an ashtray. Hum, hum, hum. Right? <laughs> Basic it's, things. Basic I mean, I, I can't even believe that people smoke. I mean, it just... No, and then you get someone Paying for the privilege, privilege as well. Right? Yeah, they pay for the privilege for that <laughs> right. too. Yeah, yeah. you get cancer and, and die early. And then, you know, because every cigarette is 14 minutes off your life, you go, what are you doing? <laughs> and then I met even a woman that smoked cigars, and they thought that was cool. And they go, ooh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not taking you out ever. And, and, you know, so, so, and you can see who a person is. It's Emerson's great line was, who you are, speak so loudly, I can't hear what you're saying. Because yeah. everyone does send out that broadcasting or receiving station, that, that and, and Emerson was obviously a favorite of, of Dr. Hills. Anyhow, so we, we said, look, I see, I saw her commanding audiences. And I'll just give one example. We're in front of tens of thousands of people in China, and I'm doing three days, and I'd written all those money books that stood on the shoulders of, of Dr. Hills, like One Minute Millionaire and Cash in a Flash and Cracking the Millionaire Code, and I'm there to teach money. Now, no one in the room is less than a billion a millionaire because they all had to pay seven thousand dollars just right. to hear us, right? And the day before, first day, I did the, all the stuff I was doing, and they're very they're very attentive and because they can't sweet. leave China. Mm -hmm. This is what people don't get about communism, socialism, and fascism. You don't get to decide to come to America or come to L.A. Mm -hmm. and visit on your show. They don't get to do that, right? They're stuck. They're right. constipated in a country because 
it's CCP is is monopolistic. Um, never said that before, but that's totally correct. And and dogmatic and and confiscatory and a couple other words I could use. The point is, we're doing it. And, and at the end, I said, "How many of you like to hear from Crystal?" Well, they went crazy, and she just wowed them. Well, the next day, <laughs> I'm doing three days with the same audience. I say, "How many of you are ready to make more money?" Not one hand went up. Because they got money, so they don't really need that. They wanted spiritual stuff. Because what happens with Maoism is Mao put himself everywhere, every, pictures everywhere, because he th- tried to become God. And now we got Xi trying to do exactly the same thing, which is an anathema to me. But I'm trying to teach capital, capitalism in communist countries there and when we talked in Vietnam and a few other places and wake them up because people really get it and they get it like that. So I said, well, how many of you want to hear from Crystal? And she's in the back of the room with the bodyguards doing her little computer and they didn't raise their hand. They all stood up and they started applauding. Wow. I, I, said, I said, oh, boy, this is a yeah, 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 yeah. Because I didn't know what to do because now I can't solve it. And, and I said, good. Crystal, come up here. And then the rest of the next two days, I just asked her questions and let them ask questions and bring it up on a pair. I had nothing prepared, but they loved it. You know, and, and they're not just hungry for spiritual enlightenment and self-growth. They are stupid. Starved for it. Desperate. Mm. And so I think that was the appeal. They they loved, like, you know, I taught meditation, mindfulness, and a lot of these emotional and, you know, issues that we're talking about. Mm. So they were just really hungry for that. It was really fun. They're they're such beautiful people. It's it's so sad to see any human being live under those conditions because every human being wants to express fully. And, you know, at that point they were coming out a little bit, able to create businesses and stuff. So it's just like they were like children in a candy store, like wanting so much growth, wanting to learn so, so badly. And uh, it was so much fun. They were so loving and so appreciative. Um, They would gift us with the most beautiful gifts. We're like, you know, thousand dollar silk dresses. One day I told this woman, I, said, I didn't get any of those. Your dress. <laughs> yeah, Mark, I need some pictures of you, <laughs> you in the silk dress. You never got that silk dress. <laughs> the, the, remember the sheet set? It was like a $2,500 sheet set. Like they couldn't be more mm. thankful and gracious. Mm. But uh, yeah, I those experiences there were really f- wonderful for us. Yeah. Really, I'm really grateful. It's hard to go there now. I don't think we would. It's gotten a little more. Yeah, um, difficult. Gonna, it's like Victor it. Frankel. You know, he talks about everyone wants purpose and meaning. Yes. Right. The most harrowing of circumstances. If you have purpose and meaning, yes. you got everything. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And that's why he stayed alive at us, which mm-hmm. and other people didn't. And that's why he wrote in search of me. I got to meet him at Bob Schuler's church not He's far so from amazing. here wow. when he owned the Crystal mm-hmm. Cathedral and spent a day with him. You know, because most people didn't had hadn't read the book, didn't do their homework. And and uh, Frankel just said, life's source, I may not be quoting this right, but life's source is all, uh, whether you have meaning or not. If you don't have meaning, and uh, right now we have 3,000 kids committing suicide a day in America, not okay with us, because we're saying, hey, wait a second. Yes, you've been shut down by COVID. Yes, all of us got, uh, you couldn't go to school, you couldn't live, you couldn't play with your friends, you couldn't go to school, go to concerts, go to music, meet girls, whatever, or boys, whatever the situation uh, situation was. But now we've got to implode meaning. And, and the parents, mm-hmm. no offense, I'm not beating on my colleague parents because we love our parenting and grandparenting skills, but is it they got to understand that, that if anyone hears only one thing out of this, if you'll have meaning in your life and tell your kid, what is the meaning of your life? And the, the wrong question that, that is asked is, what are you going to be when you grow up? And and when you're little and four or five or 10, you know, I'm going to be an astronaut. Well, maybe you are, maybe you aren't, right? Chance, we're close friends with astronauts, so we're on the board of backspace. But the fact of the matter is that not many people are going to be that. Not many people are going to be major champion basketball players, right? But everybody has something some elements of genius that they mm-hmm. need to bring forth. Mm-hmm. And that could be blue collar genius as well as, yeah. as white collar or blue collar uh, dress professional genius. And, and the books we're doing now is like, we had a guy that was ADD. He was told you know, like Edison was in the book, you know, your adult brain, you'll never amount to anything. You'll never have a job. Well, now he has thousands of employees. Last year he made 650 million. We did his book called Elevate. His name is Tommy Mello, and, and he does garage doors, and he's figured out a new way to do a garage door. Instead of wiping out in five years, it's going to last 20 years, and everybody, and he takes people that are ADD, he takes people that are former mm-hmm. prisoners, he takes them, trains them for six weeks intensively, and said, here's the way you got to do this. You're going to read Dale Carnegie's book, you're going to read Think Grow Rich, you're going to read my book, Elevate, and you're going to read the Hanson's book, Ask. 
and or listen to it because he listens because he's ADD and yeah. he can't read, right? And he's dyslexic, I think, uh, or he says he is. So I'm going to assume he is. I don't know. I can't go inside his mind. But I love. We love Tommy, and we're doing a second book with him. The point I'm making is he's saying, "Hold up a mirror." Everyone, he's got greatness in you. And what we're going to do is just, we're going to show you one path to get it out. And, and once you get in one path and you feel good about yourself, what Crystal's saying, your validity comes out of your contribution. Self-esteem has to be earned. You can't buy it. I, if I'm rich and you're my kid, I can't give it to you. You got to, and that's what's so wrong about, the, uh, we got such vast wealth. And the people are saying, well, I'll get my kid the best educator. I'll get him at Harvard. The kid's useless unless he or she finds meaning and something to be passionately purposeful about. Mm. Pull about. And Was that clear? Absolutely, absolutely. And most people, in my experience, ask or they give themselves answers to questions that shouldn't be asked in the first place. Like, like they say, "I can't do this." Right. Instead of the, so, the, obviously, the question to "I can't do this" yeah. is. Uh, oh, sorry. The, the the better question for that with that answer would be, "How can I do how this?" How can I do this? Right. Yeah, it's so much better than just saying to yourself, "I can't do this." Right. And right. most people, they, they limit themselves without having any openness as to what can possibly happen. Right. They, they and so many decision. different circumstances, you know, those types oh, of yeah. answers that come through. Yes, it's so true. They make a decision for failure instead of asking, how can I make this a success? Exactly. What yeah. would be that pathway? Who would help me? And on, on we spoke about marriages before. For people who are feeling bitter, and this, I guess, applies to business partnerships as well, for people who feel that like they've been wrong in business partnerships, or yeah. they've gone through a marriage, and they're feeling very bitter as a result of their truth of what happened, because everyone has their own their own truth. Right. How do they open themselves up to recognizing that this actually might be the stepping stone that they needed to meet the person that could change everything for them, or that their life is going to be so much better as a result of going through that experience? Yeah, well, honestly, I, um, you know, those it is the tri- the trials and challenges that make us stronger and better and teach us. I mean, we obviously have a part in every decision. So if we're with a partner, a business partner, who has done wrong by us, we were part of that dynamic. Where was there again questions? What what did what was missing? What were we overlooking? You know, was there something we weren't as thorough about as we should have been? You know, and and when you start asking those questions, you can really learn those lessons. And then, but I think the challenge is because it's happened to us. I mean, we've lost big bunches of money trusting people, right? With, you know, just trusting people too much. And we love to trust people, but, but you also have to be very diligent and, and listen to your gut, listen to your intuition. And I think in those situations, um, I would have to say when we questioned ourselves, maybe we weren't listening as carefully as we should. Um, maybe we were ignoring some things. What things did we ignore, right? Mm-hmm. What signs? So it's really about taking, you know, becoming stronger. And But the most important thing, James, I think when you have been like taken advantage of or really is forgiveness, because when you hold on to anger and bitterness, it will shut you down almost more than anything. It's like you can't create with the light when you're in the darkness and you need light to create what you want. You need to be a person of light. So forgiveness is a huge part of letting go of bitterness and anger because mm-hmm. bitterness and anger are very dark qualities. They keep you sucked down in sort of a dark pit. A personal responsibility as well. And then that forgiveness as well is such a big one. You know, one yeah. of my biggest lessons as a naive kid who Came over to the U.S. I'm the type of guy who'll do things on a on a handshake because yeah. that's just, you know, you take people at their word. He was a lot like that. Too. Yeah, and then yeah. You, you realize that yeah. there are people out there who are absolute snakes in the grass. There's all the smokes and mirrors, especially in the entertainment world, as you oh, know. Yeah. Yeah. And um, one of my biggest lessons of the last six or seven years is to trust your instinct when it comes to people. Yes. I think deep down you know when you meet someone, are they your type of tribe? Or not. I think so. Yeah. Well, it, it shows up in a lot of ways. Like when we first were getting married, she had, uh, amongst other things, a giant Great Dane dog. Now, you know how big they are. <laughs> and this <laughs> Great so Dane cute. would come to the sofa and sit down next to me and he'd go, <laughs> blah, 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 side and side. slobber all over me. But we had a guy come that we had the greatest <laughs> fake Vida you have ever seen in your life. And uh, we were starting to fall for this guy, and all of a sudden our lawyer looks at it and says, man, this guy's got an eight-page rap sheet. you got to sh- cut him loose f- as fast as you can. And so th- w- back to what you said about intuition, 
all of us get some little red flags. And the dog gave us a red flag because a dog, li- we've never seen this before. This it is a big happened. dog who's very loving and like people. When we came in here, you saw the dogs loved us. But this dog pooped right in front of this guy's feet at her house. And I thought. The first time he walked into my house, rang the doorbell, walked in. Lacey went nuts, started running the in dog. circles. Then just went over a few feet away and went poo-poo on the floor. And she never ever done that and i thought lacy was a great lo- dog has this dog yeah. lost her mind like what just no, happened dogs, animals can sense like natural sense, disasters oh, and things can't oh, they as well my before they, have oh, yeah, they tell you when she there's knew. gonna be an earthquake or a she fire knew. yeah yeah he had he had a huge rap sheet and it's interesting it was all in computer fraud mm-hmm. and we were having him run our computer systems oh my gosh wow. we're lucky we got no, out of that one so before smart. there was too much damage done because yeah. our attorney you know but, but let's go to the he ran a background check on him let's go to the biggest picture of what you asked if you stay bitter, you're not going to get better. So you got to decide what she said is go to forgiveness, which means forget, forgive them, forgive yourself. Otherwise, you're shackled. Yeah. And the shackle of unforgiveness shackles your brain and your abilities and your opportunities and your possibilities. And it, by the way, I'll, I'll do me rather than her. It's hard for me to forgive some of these people that are robbed, <laughs> robbed me, literally. And I bought into it. And it, it's totally my fault. So I got to for first forgive myself, then mm-hmm. forgive them. And as a result of that, we have accelerated. Like somebody in recent days got got us for three hundred eighty four thousand dollars. I thought, how did I not see that? But it got us to another place because the first question you ask is, you know, what what Hill learned from Carnegie was every seed has an equivalent or greater benefit. And maybe you read um, How to Raise Your Own Salary, which is a full interview between Andy and. And and it's gene. Everybody, if they can get a copy, ought to. And, and Bob Proctor, right before he died, he, you know, I own two companies with Bob, and I was going to. He and I were going to do that interview, and I was going to be Andrew Carnegie, and he was going to be uh, Doctor Hill, and and we had a publisher want to buy it, and it just didn't get done because he unfortunately had to go to the hospital and they gave him a shot. But um, and he was eighty seven, and we were ready to have his hundredth birthday, and he was going to have a million people in Las Vegas, and you know, we're very close to Bob, so and his wife Linda. And and trying to help to have that happen, and she calls up and said he didn't make it, and I went, "What? I got to do his funeral? Because I, I don't like doing funerals. I, <laughs> I, we did a good eulogy. It's online even. But the the point is, is that if you get sucked into somebody that's dishonest, and all of us do, because it's a testing ground. And, and let's I'll do the biggest metaphor: the Joseph Many Color Coat story. He had the vision as a little kid, and his brothers were jealous. Right. Put him in a pit, sold him off to Pitafor. You know, ends up. What he visualized came reality, and and can you imagine? He's standing, uh, second in command, is is saved all the food, is going to save Israel. His father, his brothers come and don't recognize him because now he's dressed dressed as an Egypt Egyptian, has kids, and his royalty. Because he said, "I will rule the nation of the world," and and so he, but he didn't get bitter. He got better. It's my new line, and I really like it. And I'm going to stick to it. <laughs> <laughs> I like that way. You know what's interesting is that when you when you're around people, they remember you for just their memories naturally, of course. But if someone was to leave and then come back, they don't remember the new you. They remember the, the all of their previous memories. It's why sometimes in a job the easiest way to progress through your career is to actually move companies where yes. they know you as someone new mm-hmm. with the skills that you bring in the present rather than how they may have viewed you when you started so a company. Add to in the present to what you see yourself as. Like, remember, I'm bankrupt and I got no money, no car, really nothing going right for me and no ability to teach in this industry. <laughs> and I'm telling them I'm a professional speaker and I'm a sales trainer because that's the right. line in the marquee he gave me. You, I. This is what a mastermind is about is they – Andrew Carnegie saw nobody marketed and manufactured steel. He said, I'm a marketing and manufactured steel, but I'm going to get the smartest minds to do it. None of those guys knew how to make steel or create Bessemer steel and have today we call it tensegrity, you know, tension integrity in his string. So, and then, and then he had nothing but adversity. His best friend, Rockefeller, he was moving all the oil on, on the uh, trains that he built and the railroads he built, and he built the first uh, Pullman cars. And that was his first big investment. As you know, I, I can go through the details, but all of a sudden, Carnegie made pipelines so he didn't need to do the railroad, so it's sh- just shoo, shoot the oil through, and suddenly he's going to bankrupt him and then buy his steel company. And he said, nobody does that to me. And by the way, that's exactly what Elon Musk is doing now, and I'll go there in a second. But 
What did he do? He built the first high rise building because they needed, there's no buildings over three or four stories at the very top. And then he built the Empire State Building because it had 10, Bessemer steel is what we call it, but it, it, 10 segregate uh, steel. And then Elon Musk has his top engineer stolen by Tim Cook. And he said, Timmy, this is like a super bad idea, brother. Mm-hmm. You shouldn't go, because I'm the only guy with a plan five years ahead written out, and, and I'm going to do this. And now he's coming out with a phone called the, the Pi phone. And he's going to, he said, I, I, he's going to charge half as much. It's going to be solar charged two hours for 60 hours. It's going to go to his 40,000 satellite Starlink, on and on and on. I can do all 12 things. I did a whole video on YouTube on it. You can watch just because I think the guy's genius. And, and Chris was telling me this morning. It's amazing how everything you do about, because most people don't see what he's doing and how he's doing. He's, and I did a comparison from Milan Musk to Andrew Carnegie. They both built integrated businesses that integrated everything you could need. Well, most people don't even see what he's put together. And I, I look at it and go, wow, that's what I'm doing. That's what we're doing in the book business right now. We're doing an integrated conglomerate that soup to nuts figures out how to make everything work. Because everyone should read, have had the, had the privilege of, and the freedom of reading. Mm, absolutely. What are you working on now that you're both most excited about? Is it the publishing business or are there some other big projects that you're... Well, we are launching, we wrote a biography. We were asked to write a biography for Reverend Ike. I think mm-hmm. you, you said you're aware of mm-hmm. Reverend Ike. He just, his work is so phenomenal. And it was such an honor to write this biography. The family commissioned us to write it. So it'll be released in the fall, which we're super excited about. Cause Some we, people will be watching this wanna, later. At Saudi Arabia. Right, by them. right. So we want to get his work out to the world. He's, he just, I mean, he was very instrumental in Mark really coming out of that that funk that he was in after he went bankrupt and he started going to Reverend Ike's church and he gave him a whole new model for for the you know how to think and mm. and how to claim the riches of heaven for yourself. Mm. So that's really exciting. Uh we're working on this new marriage program which is really exciting for us and fun because we want we feel like we have such a fun dynamic marriage. We want to be able to share whatever we've learned, whatever that is, the mistakes and the breakthroughs, and be able to help people with that. Because we think it, it just makes our communities so much stronger if we have good marriages, good families. I mean, it's kind of the core of a good community, right? Yeah. And um, and then, of course, our library, um, the Mark Victor Hansen Library, it's super exciting because we've opened up a new de- – well, we're helping bring people's stories to life, and there are so many great stories that need to be told so it's just such an adventure to go through each book with our authors and help, you know, bring them to number one and get them out there and get them launched. And we write them. We we are ghost we ghostwrite. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Because most people have great ideas, but when they sit down to write a book, it's a lot more work than you think. And writing a book is is very difficult. I mean, they'll write everything they know and then they've got maybe 20 pages and they're like, wow, where do I go from here? But and, we, and the finished book is 20% of the, you know, the other 80% is how you get it into the hands to, of as many people as possible. In, yes, into people's hands. So we love that. It's such an honor. And then the thing that uh, we're, we're actually getting a lot of um, people coming to us, some billionaires are coming to us um, for a very specific reason. They they want their biography written. They want their story told, but more for their own family for their own progeny because what's happening is you know the next generation comes along the kids the grandkids and oftentimes you know this person who built this wealth has such a rich story they came from most often they they came from nothing and created you know everything they have by pulling themselves up by the bootstraps going through a lot of trials tribulations um blood sweat and tears well then the kids and the grandkids never experience that all they experience is just great wealth getting what they want and so when it comes time to pass the money, you have a very serious problem. You're passing the money, but how do you pass the values, you know, the values that created the money? And if you don't have a way to pass the values along, then a lot of times that money will will be a handicap for them. It will not help them in life. It will actually hurt them. So it's been so much fun to to dive into these biographies and really help these families, you know, pass the values along and kind of make it um, Mitzi Perdue, our friend, you know, she comes from great wealth. And in her family, they make you write your own biography before you can inherit any wealth. And so what we're helping people with, with a friend of ours who's done, you know, um, high wealth planning for a long time is really sort of setting up a protocol where families can share these biographies and even discuss them, you know? So before you get to take all this money, you need to understand the journey 
and the value system. Yeah, absolutely. So that's really cool. Yeah, it's so good. And you know, on resilience there, and I'm speaking about stories more broadly, I feel like people who aren't resilient so much, it's because they haven't exposed themselves they haven't exposed themselves to enough stories. There is an incredible amount Correct. of stories out there of people, you know, like yes. Jim Stovall and all the other ones that we've yes. mentioned today who have overcome far more adversity than what you're going through. Right. To be able to achieve the success they have. And that's what gives life meaning. And I think that's why people, I mean, we have it so easy these days. And then I think COVID did not help um, enhance (laughs) the meaning of life. People were stuck at home and the government starts sending a whole bunch of money. And a lot of people have stayed home after that. They've become more scared of life. But the problem is that doesn't build our sense of meaning and worth. And so I'm talking to everybody out there. If you're still taking money from the government and, and not getting out there and sharing what you have with the world, I just, I would encourage everyone to take their skills, get out there, get, get to work again. Even if you're working at a restaurant, you are sharing yourself and your skills with the world. You know, every job has dignity. It depends on the dignity you bring to it. And so I just think it, it's so important for all of us to be out there moving and working and growing Mm-hmm. And sharing, you know. Yeah. Dr. Goulson said on the show, he said, most people see life as a danger to be avoided rather than an right. adventure to be lived. <sighs> Number Amen. two is more interesting. And, and back to your thing about mm-hmm. stories, the whole Bible is just 66 authors, everything from shepherds to kings. And and they've all got a story. But in the old days, everyone sat around the fire and shared their story in, in our ancestors. And what's mm-hmm. happened now is there's so much media overload yeah. with Every kind of social media, some of which we're participating in ourselves right now, that you get overwhelmed and you forget that the stories that really matter. Now, your show does stories that really matter, that are purposeful and meaningful, like we've been talking about. But a lot of this stuff is just, oh, man, I look at some of the stuff on TikTok and I go, oh, these kids, and they're wasting their mind. And then if you watch regular TV, which we don't, you go... Holy cow, that's a a total squandering of this greatest resource ever. I mean, in Ephesians, it says, you are God's greatest masterpiece. Now, if you're a masterpiece, if I own a, uh, if I'm a master at anything, I'm going to try to use that skill like Michelangelo did. They say, how you make it, David? And I hope you saw that in Florence. We've been there a couple of times. Mm -hmm. But he says, I chip you out everything that's not David. Well, it took a lifetime or you know, painting the Sistine Chapel upside down, just, you go, wow, what a, just magnificent. But everyone's got magnificence to bring out. Everyone's got a talent like Michael Jordan to bring out equivalently in basketball where he became the flying Jordan. First guy ever to lift off 48 inches at midcourt and go all the way down and, right? And uh, back to Everett, our little kid, he says, I'm going to do 50 inches of grandpa yet. I go, <laughs> He's so I determined. said, boy, I Challenge think accepted, he said. I believe yeah. he will, yeah. I said, you will. <laughs> That's right. Our last question before the rocket round. This is a question I love to ask every guest. On your best day, what's an affirmation that you would write on a flashcard that you could show yourself on your worst day? On your best day, what would you write on a flashcard to show yourself? I would yourself write the size day? of my question to determine the size of my results. So i got to ask big, bold, meaty, meaningful, worthwhile questions. Mm. I would write, be the light. Mm. Be the light. Yeah. Love it. Let's now move into the win the day rocket round. Ten questions for some quick answers. You up for this? Sure, yes. Number one, what quote inspires you the most? What quote inspires me the most is, um, the greatest privilege of a human being is to become the midwife of the awakening of another person. And mine, that's Plato. And that's Plato. That's Plato, Mm. by the way. And mine would be, uh, Neville Goddard said, live in the assumption of the wish fulfilled, which is really more understandable than Christ said, pray the thing for which you're praying has been received, been received, been received, and you'll have it. Mm. Because it didn't make any sense to me. I mean, I read it, but it didn't. (laughs) And I go, wait a second, I'm going to be a great speaker before I get a speaker. I'm going to become world's best-selling author record. I'm going to marry uh, my soulmate who I found out is going to be my twin flame before I pull that off. That's pretty bodacious. (laughs) Uh, Number two, morning coffee or evening wine? Coffee. I love the wine, but I got to have the coffee. (laughs) Both. Both. Number three, what's one bit of advice you would give your 18-year-old self? Trust yourself. Trust your gut. Don't think everybody else has the answers for you. 
journal every day and make sure you keep writing what your destiny is going to be because it, it is a forever expanding thing. Mm. So good. Number four, what book do you gift the most? Absolutely ask. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Absolutely There's ask. There's probably never a day that we don't add it to a letter. Somebody writes us or asks us or begs or is in prison and <laughs> and we electronically ship it or if we're with them at a restaurant and we see that they, you know, yeah. we carry them around in our briefcase and our, like we did for you. Yes. Mm. Is there a book that contributed most to the mindset you have today for each of you? Oh, so many books for me. But one of the one of my favorite books was The Molecules of Emotion by Candace Pert, just about how Basically, through our thoughts, we're actually creating um, cascades of chemistry that dock into the rest of our body and mind and create changes mm -hmm. in our in our physicality and our biology and everything. So, just it just is a fabulous book. Great title too, molecules. Molecule, of emotion. Yeah, molecules of emotion. Yeah. It's one of my favorite books. Yeah, Mark. What about you? What book contributed most to the mindset you have today? Tough question, I know. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 my library's got over fifty thousand books. People <laughs> give me way. books, send me books. That's a really hard yeah, I way. haven't read every one of them, but I, the ones I did, I highlighted, wrote notes, and wrote what I'm going to write about it because I want to keep pouring out books, and I think I'll contribute over five hundred books before I'm done. I, I'm going to say the book I contributed to with Jack as Chicken Soup for the Soul because. I was the master storyteller. He came and heard me and said, wow. And long story short, from my point of view, I, we had to do that. And, it, and God granted us this glorious, unequivocally cool gift. Mm -hmm. Number five, was there a vulnerability you once hid within that became your superpower? I think for me, it was being super intuitive. I felt like I could see everybody's problems. As a kid, I was very sensitive and I could see what's going on. But I also felt like I could could see all the solutions too so i would take that on myself and try to fix everyone and i think i had to learn as i got older that it's it's a superpower but you can't fix everyone they have to they have to there has to be this desire so really kind of managing that I that think. was a huge turning john Asaraf said to me he's well help the people who want the help not the people who need the help that's right one of the biggest shifts i've ever had yeah yeah huge yeah what about you mark what vulnerability became your superpower spontaneous the people that i was afraid to talk to i now get to talk to and it just you know overcoming my own sense of lack of self-worth mm. number six what's one thing you've learned about failure failure is absolutely necessary it's essential to experience success because you only really grow through your own experiences mm. Mm. failure is a temporary idea that that you got to overcome and, and you got to go over under around or through because you got to get to the other side mm. number seven if you could sit on a park bench and have a conversation with someone alive or dead who would it be Honestly, for me, for sure, Jesus, because I would ask him, how did you extend so much grace and love in the face of so much rejection? What kind of light is that, right? So amazing. I, I got to say, my parents, if you don't mind me doing poo, because they, they did such a great job with my brothers and myself. And, and I didn't know enough to ask how they accomplished the wonders that they did, because when my dad got to America, he didn't speak any English. And, and the first guy he meets that speaks Danish is a black guy. And he said, how come you speak Danish? And the guy said, you own my island. And I said, dude, says, I haven't even got $100 in my pocket. I don't own my island. You know, and he was from St. Croix. But yeah. remember, with no education, my dad didn't ever take geography and just didn't know. I'm not, dad's very smart, read National Geographic when he got, you know, rich enough to buy the magazine. But he didn't know where St. Croix was or that Denmark had founded it. <laughs> uh, number eight, what tool or resource best helps you run your life or your business? This is going to sound so silly, but Microsoft Word, I, mm. I'm a writer. Mm. I write everything down. I process everything through writing. I just love sitting on my computer and writing mm. all my ideas, obviously all the books, uh, you know, everything. Yeah. I'm exactly the same. I do that with the notes app on my mobile phone. I moved to Mac I, a year I ago. There too. It was a tough transition. Then yeah. having, yeah, having yeah. them all aligned now is, is good, yeah, actually. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I, I would do my cell phone. Like, I got 4,800 serious connections. Like, mm. I can get to almost... I. I teach, and that's why I get hired by companies to do some stuff. I can get to anyone almost in the world, I think. Mm -hmm. Number nine, share one thing on your bucket list. What's left? For me, I really want to take our kids and grandkids on the entire trek through the Holy Land. You know, follow the, like, the, the trail that the Israelis took, follow the, the life of Jesus, and just really immerse ourselves in that. I think it just seems so fascinating to understand, you know, that walk they took. Mm -hmm. 
like Elon Musk wrote five things back when he was at Stanford that he wanted to accomplish and is now doing all of them. And I wrote down when I was with Bucky, you know, 10 things that I wanted to do. And, and uh, if we create all the money I think we're going to create right now, which is more vast than ever before, uh, we're going to pull off all 10 out of 10. Because mm-hmm. I, I don't think anyone's here to waste their life. Mm-hmm. It's it's it, it's the most exciting <laughs> time in history to be alive. And that's why sh- and shows like yours are so critical, James, because some people are not awake and what her line from Plato was, is we're here to awaken your soul. Mm -hmm. You know, let me be the gadfly that Mm -hmm. pinches you awake or stabs your spirit awake or whatever you want to say. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And final question, what's one thing you do to win the day? Make someone else's day better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wake up every day and say, this is going to be another good day and I'm going to serve greatly with love. (laughs) I love it. Well, there are a bunch of ways to connect with Mark and Crystal, and we'll link to all of these in the show notes. You can follow Mark on Instagram at Mark Victor Hansen and Crystal at Crystal Dwyer Hansen. Visit their websites respectively at markvictorhansen.com and crystalvisionlife.com and grab a copy of their awesome book, Ask, on Amazon. Again, all that and more will be linked in the show notes. Crystal, Mark, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank our, you, James. It's been a pleasure. pleasure. <laughs> Thanks for joining me on another episode of the Win the Day podcast. We want to hear your thoughts on what we covered today, so drop a comment on the YouTube version of this episode with your favorite takeaway, any questions you have, or what actions you'll be taking as a result of what was shared in this episode. And if you found value in the Win the Day podcast, leave a five-star rating on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. You'll find a link to both of those in the show notes. It'll only take you a few seconds and more ratings really helps other people discover the show so they can get the mindset upgrade they need and we can bring more winners into the Win the Day movement. That's all for this episode. Get out there and win the day. Until next time, onwards and upwards, always.